Spirit of 66 is being brought to you by National Beer, the Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a national beer. Good evening and welcome to our program, The Spirit of 66. In essence, the story of how the Orioles won the 1966 pennant. And the man sitting next to me is a man who's been associated with the Baltimore Orioles for a long time. Chuck Thompson, this must have won, been one great big boot for you this year. <laughs> It's the first baseball team I've ever been associated with that has won a championship, John, and I, I honestly didn't realize what a great big boot it could be. And our purpose tonight is to kind of go back and try and recreate a lot of the great thrills that all of us had in 1966. And so you say, well, where do you start? <laughs> Gee, there were, there were so many fellows that made so many contributions and so many ball games. So we thought perhaps it might not be a bad idea, John, if we started with one of the small men, so-called small men. Actually, he's a big man in this baseball business, and I don't see how he could have had a greater year. And I'm referring to the Orioles shortstop, Louis Aparicio. So right now, we're going to once again create the sights and the sounds of Oriole baseball in 1966 with a look at Aparicio, fantastic and unbelievable. Aparicio. Out at second, double play. Off Watt's hand, backed up nicely by Aparicio, and he's got him at first base. Out is the call at first base. Aparicio to his right, let's see if he gets him. Yes, sir. Stop by Aparicio. Got him. Oh, my goodness, what a play from Aparicio. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And the Boy is headed for second. He's out. Oh, what a play from Aparicio. He's done it again. Oh, that Aparicio for the double play. He's done it again. Mm. He goes. Fair ball. <laughs> Left three for three. to left field. Leffrey. Makes the catch. Leffrey came sliding in on one of his patented hustling efforts out in left field. He got a little late start on it. The ball was hit good and high. And then Leffrey had to make that extra hustling effort at the last moment, sliding to make the catch. Very well hit out to right center field. And it's in the bullpen. A home run for Kurt Leffrey out into deep right center field, falling right in front of the Red Sox bullpen. And the Birds have another home run wallet. So it's now 16 to 4. Leffrey's 11th home run, his 31st and 32nd runs batted in with Powell on ahead of him. Out the right field. Let's see if Barry can get it. No, three. It's gone. Home run for Fluffery. Number 19 on the year for Kurt. A little bit of a contrast there in styles. The soft, smooth, effortless feeling of Louis Aparicio and the kind of abrupt, abrupt but nevertheless effective fielding of Mr. Bleffery, Clank as he's called. 
Oh, what a great nickname. I don't know where I first heard that, but I think maybe in spring training, John, we're playing down in South Carolina, and there's a junkyard right across the street from the ballpark full of, you know, dilapidated automobiles and bathtubs and things like that, and the clubs piling off the bus. And Frank Robinson spoke up, and he said, Bleffrey, go across the street and get yourself another glove. But he is a, a very competitive and a very aggressive ball player, and like all of the other birds, made a great contribution. The fellows that have made contributions. Right now, we'd like to take you through the sights and sounds of fellows like Brooks Robinson, Boo Powell, and Paul Blair, right after this word from National Beer. The Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a national beer. Here we are at the Peakness. The Peakness? Yeah, our annual crab race. Wait a minute. Who can ride a tiny crab like that? A tiny, tiny jockey. Who else? They're in the gate, and they're off and running. Going to the front is cracked crab, followed by lemon slice, cold beer on the rail, and still in the gate, soft shell. The end of the turn is cold beer on tap, cracked crab, lemon slice, and here comes soft shell. The end of the stretch is cold beer and soft shell, soft shell and cold beer, and soft shell gets up and wins it. How about that soft shell? Soft shell? Goes good with a national beer. The Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a light beer. A beer that's easy to live with. National beer. Base hit. Etchebarren will score. Aparicio will score. The throw into third base holds Bluffery at second and Brooks on at first base with two runs batted in. Brooks Robinson with a nice stop. High throw, but Powell has made the tag. 2-2 two -two pitch to Brooks. Shallow left field, Demeter coming on. No, sir, he trapped it. <laughs> Robbie headed for two. He's there. The ruling is a two-base hit for Brooks Robinson. Find a hole. Get in there, you little darling. Snyder is going to score, and we finally have a run in this ball game. And it belongs to the birds. Brooks Robinson knocks in his 28th run. Wind direction has changed ever so slightly out toward right field now. Killebrew. Whoops. Oh, oh. Day for third. They're going to send him home. Johnson's trying. Here's the throw coming. He's in. Robinson to third. Robbie's coming home. You talk about daring base running. You've just seen it. And how about a tip of the hat to third base coach Billy Hunter. Nice stop by Brooks. And a good play. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Can he get there? No, sir. A home run for Brooks Robinson. Number 12, <laughs> three more bird runs. Ain't a beer cold. <laughs> Base hit. Bluffery's throw on toward the plate. Cut off the throw to second by Brooks, and he's out at second base, tagged out. They're looking for the bunt, and he bunts it. Powell's going to make the play to third, and he is out. Half hop by Brooks. Fine play. Out to center field, chasing back is Stanley. And that one is gone. So Boog Powell hits one out, and the Birds step out to a 2-0 lead on the big fella's second home run of the series and of the year. Oh, let's see where it's going to go. You guessed it. Home run, Boog Powell. Powell hit that last better than halfway into the bleacher section. The Orioles lead three to nothing. 
Powell has just rocked his third home run, his eighth and ninth RBIs of the season. Oswell is the other right-hander. He was in the foreground of the picture. Uh-oh, stay fair, stay fair. It did, and the birds have two more runs. Boog's seventh home run. And now it's a different kind of a game. Four to three. Looking to Powell. Oh my. Oh my. Oh my goodness, what a clout for a home run. Oh my goodness, halfway up the light tower. You know, that might have gone over the billboard sign out there. Hadn't hit the light tower. Boogs, 12th home run and two more bird tallies. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. Let's watch the right field of Northrop. Into the upper deck for the home run. And for a moment, I thought that was going to land on the roof. Boog Powell, his 20th home run, and the birds lead it 4-3. to three. What a smash off the bat of Powell. Right into the teeth of a booming wind. Oh my. Let's watch Calavito. It's gone. Home run Powell. Oh my goodness. And the first one with a man on. Brooks scores the fifth run and Powell will score the sixth run. And that's number 24 for Boog. And he slices one off to left field for a base hit, maybe more. That's Lopez after the ball. Brooks on to third. Lopez can't pick it up, and Brooks is trying to score. The relay, he is safe. The ball away from Gibbs. And now Powell is on his way to second base, and the throw goes out into right center field, and now gets away from Tresh. Here's Powell trying to score. There'll be a play at the plate. No, there won't. He's past Gibbs. Well hit the center field. Let's see if Valentine can get to it. No, sir. Home run. Home run for the big man, Boo Powell. That's number 27. Boy, he got all of that one. Drilled it to deep right center field. Watching Paul Blair coming hard. He held on to it and the ball game is over. Way to go, Paul. To the hole at short, and it's by Adair for a base hit. Bowens is coming to the plate, and there's no throw made by the left fielder, Barry. So we're tied at 1-1. Held at second base, advancing there on Paul Blair's base hit. Chuck, in that segment, we saw a couple of real success stories. Two fellas who, in the early part of the year, were batting very, very low. Mm -hmm. Boog Powell, who went from 180 to 295 in a stretch of about three months, and Paul Blair, who from mid-season went from 220 to up near 270. And uh, fortunately, a lot of those Blair base hits were of the clutch variety. They were very important base hits. Manager Bauer spoke all year long, John, about uh, all combination of the bench, and the great young rookies. And he was referring to the likes of, oh, I guess Sam Bones, and Russ Snyder, Andy Etchebarron, and Dave Johnson. And we'd like to look at those fellas after this word from National Beer. The Chesapeake Bay way of living, rich in tradition, warm with hospitality and pleasant living. But sometimes the natives get restless. To the land of pleasant living, where it's Chesapeake good go go time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Around Chesapeake Bay, when you hear people say, "Let's have a light beer," yeah, 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 yeah. well, the beer that they mean on the Chesapeake team is National Beer, the Chesapeake Bay way of living. Calls for a national beer. The Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a light beer that's easy to live with. National beer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. 
Frank Robinson chasing, Jerry Adair chasing off the right field line, and Sam Bowens comes on to make a fine tumbling catch. There's one that may be out of here. If it stays fair, it's a fair ball. Home run for Bowens. Well, back to back homers by Powell and Bowens, and the birds are coming back. That one could be, and no, Sam Bowen's a nice catch out in right field. This could be it. A base hit, Nosek with the ball, the throw to the plate, he is safe. And the ball game is over. That could be six if it's fair, it's a fair ball, fair ball in the corner. Barry digging it out. Not in time on Snyder at second. Aparicio holding at third as Echebarron has scored. And the Orioles lead 3-0. The runner goes. The throw is to Aparicio. And they make the put out at second base. Oh, there's a pretty good fly ball out to deep left field. Stahl is going chasing. It's off the wall. Bowens has rounded third. He's coming on to score. They're waving in Dave Johnson and he'll come on to score. Two base hit for Echebarron. 2-1 pitch to Echebarron. That is well hit to right. Watching Oliva. It's going to go. Hot dog, you all. Echebarron has hit his fourth home run, and the Birds get two more. Five to one. Echebarron's fourth home run. Mm-mm. Very well hit out to left field. If it stays, it will go all the way. It is a home run. A home run for Andy Echeverry. Well, the runner coming in. Here's Aparicio's throw to the plate. They've got the rundown started. Aparicio tags everybody but the, or rather, Echeverry tags everybody but the umpire. <laughs> A.G. is out. That'll get another one in. Let's see what Dave can make out of it. <laughs> Johnson is at second base. He's going to go for three. Should make it standing up. Johnson's going to try. Oh, boy. Didn't he bring off a dandy? Oh, my goodness. Pretty well hit ball is out to left center field and it goes up into the screen. A home run for Davey Johnson. It just cleared the wall out in deep left center field and then went up into the screen. Another home run for the Birds this afternoon. Two more runs come home ahead of Davey Johnson. Three in all and it's the Birds 12, the Red Sox 1. Base hit, another base hit for Johnson. That's his second of the afternoon. Played and then lost by Canigliaro. And Johnson will round second base. He's going to try for three. The throw to third, not in time. He's in safely. Steve Johnson on a great play, but his throw to first base is not in time. Chuck, you've got to like Hank Bauer for gambling and winning early in the season, going with two rookies straight up the middle where you've mm -hmm. got to be strong. He used. Uh, Echebarron behind the plate and rookie Dave Johnson at second base and it worked. And I imagine none of us will ever realize just how much pressure those youngsters had to carry because they didn't talk a whole lot about it. And now we've talked about the young fellas. Let's talk about a fellow that was referred to as being an old 30. Uh, <laughs> I've seen good pros have good years before. But John, never in my life have I seen a good pro have the kind of a year that Frank Robinson had. He'll be the most valuable player and if I know Frank Robinson, he will win the Triple Crown. And now the sights and the sounds of Frank Robinson after this word from National Beer. National Beer presents the Ballad of the Constellation. She was built near Baltimore's Harris Creek, the pride of the bay called Chesapeake. Her guns were the hope of the new little nation, and they christened her Constellation. 
first France felt the fury of her fighting heart. She defeated Napoleon for a start. The seven seas she sailed for many a year, then retired to a grateful nation's cheers. She's a place to go on a summer's day, part of the lore of Chesapeake Bay. Another tradition here in the land of pleasant living is national beer. A light beer that always leaves room for one more. The Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a national beer. Welcome aboard. Oh my goodness. Where's this going to come down? Oh my. Upper deck home run for Frank Robinson. His 13th see where the usher picks this one up. Somebody in the upper deck is after it. It hit about on the third or fourth row, I believe. Here's another long blast out to the left field corner. And it's a home run for Frank Robinson, 335 feet away down the left field line. Frank Robinson. Oh, that's hit. Let's see. Well, another bird run. Number 15. He's out of the ballpark. We'll wait for the official ruling on it. Now, Hawk is going to argue this one, believe me. Robinson had it and then fell into the front row of the seats, and the Yankees will put up a real beat. And let's not run away. Let's not go anywhere. But the call of out has been given by Hank Soar, and Hauk is beside himself. And this is uh, the battling manager of the Yankees accosting umpire Hank Soar. He caught the ball, says Mr. Soar, and then fell into the seats with it. And there goes another one. And this will give him the leadership in home runs in the American League. And the Birds a 2 nothing edge over the Red Sox. Number 18. And Mr. Frank Robinson just plays one game. Hit. My goodness. Frank Robinson has a long way to go. Oh, what a catch. Gee, what a fine catch by Frank Robinson. Well, let's watch the left fielder Wagner. He says, forget it, it's gone. Frank Robinson's 32nd home run of the year, and the Birds make it 6-3. to three. What a blast. Oh, my goodness. Well, that one went about 440 feet, and the fourth run is in, and Frank now has his 33rd home run. That's it rather well. I don't know. Yes, sir. He's done it again. Frank Robinson has done it again. Look at that one. It is going to be long out of here. 
into the upper deck. There, see that fellow right there bending over to pick it up? That's where it hit, right in there. Boy, what a shot. Home run number 34 for Frank Robinson and the Orioles lead two to nothing. There it goes. It is going. It is in the mezzanine again in left field. A home run for Frank Robinson and a home run derby jackpot of $2,500 to George J. Carter, 111 Ridge Road in Baltimore, Maryland. Chuck, that man is a marvel and a triple crown. First one since 1956 would be one heck of a way for him to end the season he's had. As I said a little while ago, John, honestly, if I know Frank Robinson, he'll, he, he'll win it. He's just too close and too good a competitor and too good a pro. Fine, fine year, and it, it just couldn't happen to a finer fellow. I hope, I hope that he learns to love Baltimore the way we've learned to love him. Boy, I'll tell you. <laughs> there were a lot of other fellows who made contributions through the year, especially in the tail end when Charlie Lau came through with a tr uh, triple out in Chicago yeah. that had him chugging like old 97 into third base. <laughs> That wasn't a slide at the end, <laughs> really, John. <laughs> a lot of fellas, uh, gosh, Woody Held and, and Bob Johnson and Vic Rosnowski, right. Camillo Carrion, Larry Haney, and the pitchers. We haven't, we haven't mentioned the pitchers. We haven't got any 20-game winners, but a lot of fine pitchers and a great bullpen. How can you need 20-game winners, Chuck, when you've got a bullpen that Bauer has? Oh, gee, it's great. Stu Miller, Dick Hall, Mo Drabowski, and Eddie Fisher. Just wonderful. And John Miller came out with yeah. some great, well-pitched ball games. Dave McNally and Jim Palmer and Eddie Watt. And the old vet, <laughs> Steve Barber. Steve Barber. Don't forget the young fella Phoebus at the end of the year. Right. Gee, there were just so many. All made great, great contributions. Contributions made by the pitchers in the regular season couldn't compare to what they were able to do in a four-game series against the world champions of 1965, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Who in his wildest hopes and dreams could have imagined what four young men would be able to do against a team that was rated just about invincible by the national press and the sports broadcasters who did the games on radio and television? Wally Bunker, Jim Palmer, Dave McNally, and Mo Drabowski. Three of them are part of the Orioles' Peach Fuzz platoon. The fourth, Drabowski, was a Kansas City reject before the Orioles picked him up in last winter's draft. All this quartet did was set a new series record. From the third inning of the first game until the end, they gave the Dodgers not one run and few scoring opportunities, and they confounded the people who had run them down as mediocre. Grabowski set a new strikeout record and tied another. Palmer and McNally pitched four hitters. Bunker pitched a three hitter. And while we're talking about contributions, there's one man without whose contributions the Birds could not have won a world championship. Frank Robinson, a homer in his first time at bat to break the hearts of the Dodgers, a homer in the fourth game to provide the margin by which the Orioles won. In between, a couple of base hits, a knowledge of the Dodgers, a confidence that rubbed off on everybody else. This man was truly the most valuable player on the Baltimore roster, but especially in the World Series. Brooks Robinson, Paul Blair, Davey Johnson, Russ Snyder, Louis Aparicio, Boog Powell, Andy Etchebaron, all had a hand of some kind in bringing off the stunner of the year, a sweep of the Dodgers by the Baltimore Orioles. Now, let's look at this 1966 World Series. Let's see how a club that was poor-mouthed by some as a winning team in a second-rate league took the champions of the world and left them for dead in four straight games. Remember, before the first game opened on October 5th, the Dodgers were listed by the odds makers as 8-5 to five to win the World Series. They were 2.5-1 to one to take the first game. And the knowledgeable people who make odds were giving 20-1 to one against an Orioles sweep. Remember out in Los Angeles in the first inning after Aparicio was retired, Russ Snyder drew a walk. And then Frank Robinson drilled a home run into the left field seats off Don Drysdale. Russ Snyder scored the first run of the World Series in 1966, and Frank Robinson scored the second. And had both waited at home plate for a few moments, they could have greeted Brooks Robinson. Because Brooks uncorked a shot that landed deeper into the left field seats than did Frank Robinson's. Way up in the back. And before half an inning was gone, the Orioles had a 3-0 lead. 
Snyder advanced it to four to nothing in the second inning with a timely single that drove in a run. And then in the bottom of the second, Jim Lefevre got to a shaky Dave McNally and laced a home run for the Dodgers that made the score four to one. In the third inning, with two runners on base, John Roseboro lofted a fly up the power alley in right center field. Russ Snyder made a fantastic catch on the ball and prevented what at least would have been one run and probably two. Grabowski came on in the third inning with the bases loaded and proceeded to set six men down on strikes and overall through the game struck out 11. A 5-2 to two final in that first game. The Orioles had done what some considered the impossible. They beat the Dodgers at Chavez Ravine. Incidentally, it was the first time the Dodgers had ever lost a World Series game in Dodger Stadium. Here's where the Scoppers had a field day. So the Orioles had won the first game. But all they had to fall back on was the bullpen again, and their luck couldn't last. In the second game, Palmer was starting against Koufax, and Koufax was only the best pitcher in baseball. He had clinched the Dodger pennant just four days earlier in Philadelphia. He had his rest. He was ready. But his teammates sold him down the river with the most comical display of oopsie-daisy ever seen in a World Series. To top it, Palmer pitched a four-hit shutout. The old pro Dodgers, the invincible Dodgers, cracked under the strain, and the birds took them to the cleaners. Palmer and Koufax hooked up in a scoreless duel until the fifth inning, Boo Powell got things rolling with a single. Not much, just a single. But then Paul Blair lofted a fly into center field and Willie Davis apparently lost it in the sun. By the time things quieted down, Boo Powell had moved to third and Paul Blair was safely at second. And then Andy Etchebarren hit another fly ball into center field. Whoops. Again, he dropped it. And then Davis overthrew third base. And Paul Blair came in to score the second run. Etchebarren went to third. And then Aparicio doubled him home with a shot down the line to left field. A three to nothing ball game in favor of the Orioles. But it didn't stay three to nothing. Ron Peronoski came on in relief for Sandy Koufax in the seventh, and he contributed to the whole business by throwing a ball past first base into the dugout. The Orioles kept on running, and by the time they stopped running, they had scored six runs. And Jim Palmer had pitched a four hitter, the youngest series pitcher ever to pitch a shutout. The last out of the ball game, that was it. And the Dodgers were down by two games. The first time in their history, the Dodgers had lost two World Series games at Chavez Ravine. The rest of the series coming up after this word from National Beer. The Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a national beer. Here we are at the Peakness. The Peakness? Yeah, our annual crab race. Wait a minute. Who can ride a tiny crab like that? A tiny, tiny jockey. Who else? They're in the gate, and they're off and running. Going to the front is cracked crab, followed by lemon slice, cold beer on the rail, and a still in the gate, soft shell. The end of the turn is cold beer on tap, cracked crab, lemon slice, and here comes soft shell. The end of the stretch is cold beer and soft shell, soft shell and cold beer, and soft shell gets up and wins it. How about that soft shell? Soft shell? Goes good with a national beer. The Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a light beer. A beer that's easy to live with. National beer. So the Orioles had a 2 to nothing lead in games, and the series was coming back to Baltimore, 3,000 miles from Dodger Stadium, into a ballpark where the Dodgers could get their base hits and score some runs, said the experts. But those experts weren't in the majority anymore. The Orioles were now the betting favorites in the series. Each game was even money. And on Thursday night or Friday morning, if you want to call it that way, the Orioles returned to Baltimore in a special charter. More than 7,000 screaming fans jammed Friendship Airport to get a look at their heroes. It was a cold night and a warm crowd. There were go-go girls dancing on car roofs and one worried fan who carried a sign begging the birds to lose at least one. He had tickets for the fifth game. 
And I don't think that there was one of those Orioles who in his heart of hearts didn't think that fan had a mighty good chance of seeing that fifth game. A few hours later, the Dodgers plane came to a stop at the same place at the airport, and a plane load of lonely ball players was met by nobody but baggage attendants. After a day's rest, Walter Alston sent his club out on the field hoping to pull off last year's script again, coming back from a two-game deficit. It didn't work. Wally Bunker against Claude Osteen, game number three. A new record crowd of 54,445 packed Memorial Stadium for that third game. And Dick Brown, the former bird catcher, threw out the first ball. And the stage was set for the third quarter of what turned out to be a four-quarter affair. In the first inning, Kurt Bleffery clanked into the wall in the left field corner and held on to the ball for the big play of the game. Up to that point, a big out. In the second inning, the Orioles wiped out a Dodger threat with a quick double play, and here the Dodgers turned the same, same trick on the birds in the bottom of that inning. In the third, Aparicio got fielding honors with a beautiful effort on Kennedy's bid for a base hit. He threw him out. In the fourth, Wes Parker touched Bunker for a long ground roll double. Parker's best shot of the series, by the way, almost a home run. And frankly, Parker thought it was. Then the umpire chased him back to second base. It had bounced on the runway and into the crowd. But Willie Davis flied out for the second out of the inning, fairly walked, and the fever struck out. End of threat. Then in the bottom of the fifth inning, Paul Blair hit an Osteen pitch harder than he has ever hit a baseball before. Way back into the temporary bleachers in left center field. made it a one to nothing ball game and apparently Wally Bunker agreed to the one run he went out to protect it. he got Lou Johnson to hit a grounder at Aparicio for the third and final out in the ninth inning and the ball game Bunker had duplicated Jim Palmer's shutout of two days before he had given the Dodgers only three hits and he had extended the Orioles shutout streak against Dodger batters for 24 consecutive innings which isn't bad for a pitching staff had been touted as poor at best. And so the Dodgers were down to their last life. The Orioles were building for a sweep if they could arrange it. The managers were coming back with their opening day pitchers, both of whom were touched in their first appearance. A Sunday ball game. And Sunday is the worst day for baseball attendance in Baltimore. But not this particular Sunday. Saturday's attendance record was broken wide open. 54,458 fans were squeezed into every available seat in the ballpark. And of course, all of us were looking to see if the Orioles could pull it off. If they didn't, they'd have to face Koufax the next day. As it turned out, Drysdale pitched well enough to win against anybody but the Orioles. Dave McNally pitched well enough to win against anybody, period. Through the first three innings, both pitchers were virtually untouchable. Drysdale gave up one hit, McNally none. Dave Johnson banged into a double play in the second inning to end a mild threat. Tommy Davis hit into a double play in the top of the fourth and the Dodgers had a man on. Aparicio to Johnson to Powell. In the bottom of the fourth, Drysdale committed one mistake and Frank Robinson cashed in on it. Home run measured unofficially at 410 feet. It hit 10 rows from the back of the bleachers. His second home run of this particular series, both of them off rise there. It was 1-0 for the Orioles in the fourth inning, and that one run was forced to stand up. In the fifth, Lefevre let off with a single. McNally got Parker to hit into a double play. Kennedy led off the sixth with a single, and Echebarren cleaned him off with a strike to Aparicio as Drysdale struck out at the plate. No steal today. In the eighth, Paul Blair nearly duplicated a fantastic catch made by Willie Davis earlier in the game and almost in the same place. Jim Lefevre with a deep drive to center, but no cigar for him either. 
And then came the ninth with two men on base and Stu Miller warming in the bullpen. Paul Blair squeezed the final out into his glove and the baseball world had new champions. So the Orioles reign as champs of the boy baseball world until next October when they'll have to do it again. They didn't wait for someone to bestow the crown on their heads. They took it like Napoleon and crowned themselves. They wrenched it away from the defending champion Dodgers and used a baseball bat to threaten the former champs. They did it in four consecutive games. They got the good, no, great pitching. And they got timely hitting. For their efforts, they'll split the biggest series jackpot in history. For their part, the Dodgers will come back from the tour of Japan with more victories than they picked up in the series, and a check for about $8,000 will be waiting for each of them, which isn't bad play for losing four in a row. The players on the Oriole roster will get fat over the winter on the banquet circuit. Many of them will make a lot of extra money on speaking engagements, endorsements, and so on. And the Oriole front office will start a plan for next year, still savoring what's happened this time. In the locker room after the clincher, Jerry Hotberger pretty much summed things up in a conversation with John Sterling. This is the leader in his first year, Rookie of the Year, Jerry Hotberger. John, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a happy rookie. I can That's, guarantee you that. Can you imagine this? You, you're now champions. You're champions for the whole year. Yeah, right. Got a whole year to go, and then we start all over again. You never could have dreamed this. No, I sure couldn't. And this pitching. No. Uh -uh. Uh, this you know, we don't have any pitching. Is that no, what they I all know say? That. Huh? The Orioles are bad yeah, pitching. Good hitting with bad yeah, pitching. That's right. Isn't that tremendous? And you know, uh, nothing about our defense was ever said. You know, you've you know? Uh, you've, you've mentioned so many times that you know that the Hopberger family has been in Baltimore for so many years, and you want to do this for Baltimore. And you know, Baltimore, that's the king city now in sports for this. Well, you know, that's what I said in the, down in Florida. I really did want to do it for Baltimore. Uh, we've we've taken a lot out of the town. We wanted to give something back. I think maybe this is a piece. Of I kind of think so. And, and now now we've looked back over the sights and sounds of 1966, and you say. I, you know, we know what happened, but uh, I'd love to look at it again. And Bill, what was that final score again? Six to one, the birds are leading. A ball well hit out to left center field, been chased by Snyder. And let's see if he got it or not. Snyder to get it in left center field. And the birds have won the 1966 pennant. And what a way to end it. A tremendous diving clutch catch by Russ Snyder. The Spirit of 66 was brought to you by National Beer. The Chesapeake Bay way of living calls for a national beer.